start this uh, conversation with uh, Professor Jean-Claude Delonte, who is here in Torino again, is uh, a trustee of the Nexus Center for Internet Society, and is very glad to have him here again to talk about uh, not only open access, but also libraries, because as you will see, his, uh, his thoughts are focused on the, the future, the present and the future of libraries. Uh, considering that the people in front of me, I don't think there is much need to present, then could be done once again, but let me say that he's a professor at the University of Montreal and um, has been one of the very first people thinking about systematic thinking about open access uh, and the future of scholarly communication. Uh, some of his publications are also translated into Italian and freely available online. And um, is we are for us it's a honor to be connected with him. He has been here when we announced that we were going to do the Open Access Repository portal. Then he came back when we actually launched the Open Access uh, Repository, and now he's here again to talk about uh, uh, well, libraries and open access, new alliances and new strategies. But if you look at the question in we will also be talking about libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, yes, it's a great pleasure to be back here in really your favorite city of mine, Torino. <laughs> and uh, thank you for uh, coming here and sharing some thoughts about, uh, I think, a, a difficult period in the history of libraries, and also a difficult period, to some extent, in the history, the short history, the young history of open access. So uh, I, I would like to, to start with, uh, because of this double concern and worry, uh, I start with this difficult question. Are there signs, can we say, that the library profession is presently imploding? And the, the problem is that when I say that, I'm not saying this idly. I'm not just saying this as a form of pro provocation. Uh, there are many signs that may well indicate that it is really imploding. Let me give you some ideas of those. Now, first of all, this was a library in Russia after the, uh, you know, the, the, the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm not saying our libraries are going to end up that way, but uh, this is the, you know, the possibility that these huge collections of books are becoming, in effect, uh, nonsensical, I mean, becoming a pile of books, not even a museum, they're just a pile, uh, a wreckage of books. So what are the signs that I would say point to uh, the problems of the library? It used to be that you were not allowed to bring food in the library. And you could eat, you could drink and all that. Nowadays, to try and attract people, you sort of transform the library into a kind of, a, of, a, of an eating center with the hope that people are, may use some of the traditional services of the library. You have to attract people to the library. Why? Well, because now people are accessing a lot of information, of course, online, from their home, from their office, without having to move to a particular place about the library. The fact that the libraries do own a space is certainly something that can be capitalized upon. But uh, it seems that libraries so far have not found yet the good recipes to make use of the volumes and the spaces that they have. We put computers in libraries. Well, you need to put computers in libraries. I see computers over there, but I see people around walking with their own computers. So you don't, again, you don't really need that except for the people that might not have computers. But these are becoming, at least inside universities, fewer and fewer. We are in the habit of putting a lot of books in compact storage off campus which is as if to say, oh, well, the library doesn't even matter anymore. We just store that on the ground somewhere. And you call the book occasionally every 10 years if someone needs that particular book. Perhaps more fundamentally, uh, the literature, the, the, the present uh, literature around the profession strikes me as terribly pessimistic, as if to say, uh, who are we? What are we becoming? What can we do in the future? Uh, is there, is there a, a role for us uh, in, in the coming world? And many of the, of the conclusions of these papers that we read in the literature are often, at best, ambiguous, saying, well, we hope that with this and that and that will be 
we may be able to continue the profession, but there is no, no feeling that the, the, the people in the profession are the masters of, this, of their own destiny. And they seem to be more reacting to forces from the outside. And I could have added a lot more, uh, a lot more symptoms like this, but just to, to show very, very quickly that there is a malaise, a real malaise in the profession, and that uh, we should take it seriously. And then perhaps we should even cry over libraries like this in manga, uh, Japanese manga that uh, I found on the web. So let's look at uh, some reasons why this kind of uh, situation has emerged. And uh, I would like to just focus on a couple of them. Uh, it seems to me that one of the important elements that has happened very slowly, very gradually, since in fact, I would say probably uh, the, the period between the two world wars, the 30s, uh, would be a good, a good period to start with. There has been a, a loss of contact between the researchers and the librarians. Nobody in a, in a well-organized world where information is enormous and the researchers don't have much time to find that information. Libraries should be partners. They should be close partners of the researchers. They should be teams working together. And I know that among librarians we discuss this. But in effect and in reality, library, librarians are there on their side and then the faculty, the researchers and the students are there. And they address each other in a kind of service, client, customer kind of relationship, which is not a good, a good way to imagine and think about a team. One of the reasons why this is so is that the size of libraries, the kind of information that was developing, even with the print world, uh, made these two, these categories of people behave differently. A, a librarian uh, has to deal with statistical uses of, 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 of books. You find you need profiles, you want to understand what populations of people use, and then you try to find the best combination to respond to that, that demand from your, your constituency. So researchers don't behave that way at all. They're pursuing a problem and they, they want information about this question, and they try to find the article or the two or three articles that really will help them uh, to, to do that. So I use this rather violent metaphor here to uh, separate the, the, the position of both groups. Uh, researchers are like knowledge snipers. They try to really hit and identify a specific piece of knowledge, while librarians are trying to under understand uh, where the strategic stuff is and try to uh, bring it to access. In this case, I use the, again, violent metaphor of carpet bombers as a way to separate uh, two mentalities about how to, to, to hit targets. There is also the fact that in the profession, uh, has, there has developed a, a sort of mentality, and I find it personally as a researcher regrettable, a mentality of procurement obsession. We're there to procure stuff for the, the, our constituencies. We're there to, to try and bring about the stuff to them. So we are the interface with those who provide that information, and that becomes, in effect, later on, uh, people that are the customers of big publishers. So you have a role there for libraries which becomes extraordinarily specific and at the same time extremely limited. You have to deal with some publishers and then find what you want to buy from them. And as we will see and we know already, uh, these things have taken on uh, an overwhelming part of the work of many, many librarians. And then, of course, digitization has arrived. That has been going on for at least 20 years now, if not more. But it, uh, it means that a, a number of very important consequences have, have taken place. The most important consequence, to my mind, is that libraries used to buy stuff and then preserve it, organize it, and put it uh, into uh, some accessible form for, the, for their uh, constituencies. Now libraries do not own anything. Libraries essentially buy li access licenses with all sorts of conditions which in, in fact have allowed, uh, you might say, the publishers 
to completely uh, circumvent the protective dimensions of the copyright laws, while of course sitting on the copyright law to ensure the fact that they own, they own the stuff. But think of something like science direct that also be here nowadays. This is a navigational tool which has been organized by a, a company, both to help the users, but also to promote their own stuff against other companies and other publishers. It's a way of guiding the readers to read ever more Elsevier stuff at the expense of, a, of time that could be spent on other things. It's, a, it's also a task which used to be librarian, the task of librarians. You used to organize the navigation uh, through the information with bibliographies and with card catalogs. Now publishers retain that. You used to protect, store, and maintain collections of, of materials. Now these are all servers that do not belong to you. They belong to uh, the publishers again. Now there are some variations on that theme. There are some libraries that manage to get a copy of what the publisher has. There are ways of ensuring legally uh, uh, the access to, to the materials even if uh, you do not subscribe to that particular uh, mater those mater particular journals later on, but you are still in, in a situation in which you no longer control that uh, sort of uh, situation. The metaphor I've used very often is that librarians that used to have a whole mm, gas station, gasoline station, with a reservoir and the equipment to dispense the thing, any organization of the gas stations and all that, plus the, the muzzle in the end to put it into the car individually. And nowadays, uh, just have the muzzle. They just hold the, the end of the pipe. And uh, where librarians used to have an attitude of opening up the information to as many people as they could do it institutionally and or legally, nowadays they play the, the inverse role. You have the right kind of stuff to access the stuff that we have licensed for some specific kinds of people. So the, the role has been subverted and inverted at the same time in such a way that you, the, the malaise inside the profession is not very difficult to understand. The librarians, in a sense, are finding themselves with, you might say, less and less to do. The publishers are taking back more and more, and all you have to do, essentially, is have a, a, a legal advice office, a, a good accountant, some economies to calculate the, the benefits of the licensing prices that you're offered, and then you go negotiate with all these people, uh, with each publisher, to try to optimize access to, uh, to the information. That's not what librarians used to do, and it's not terribly glorious compared to what librarians used to do. So, you know, the malaise is not difficult to understand. And my son just finished a degree in library science, and I keep on saying, you have to reinvent that profession. You have to reinvent it very prof profoundly. So, let's take an example that comes from my own university, which I think illustrates this situation extremely well. Uh, at one point, I, the librarian of our university, Montreal, was instructed by the administration to reduce its acquisition budget because there are pressures, financial pressures on the university. Familiar story. I'm sure you have lived through similar things. I don't know of a university, even the big private ones, that has not gone through this sort of thing. So they tried to do it, but this time by breaking a, a big deal. I'm not going to explain to you, I imagine, what a big deal is, but you know, the, this, is what the, this is the way the publishers have really put their grip on, on, the, on libraries, because apparently it looks like a good deal. You get a lot of titles for a certain sum of money that you couldn't get if you bought them one by one, or you bought a subset of it. And so as a result, when you want to extract yourself from that, uh, the cost becomes enormous. In the case of my university, when they started saying to Wiley, we do not want the big deal, Wiley said, fine, we have a list price, just calculate the, uh, the titles you want, and we'll see what, uh, what it gives, and then you can pay that. And when the university started, the library started doing an analysis of how they could cut in terms of the local usage of Wiley periodicals, 
they found that if they cut the, 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 the period, number of periodicals to, to 70% of usage, which got down to about 350, 350 uh, uh, titles per year instead of the 1,500 titles that Wiley uh, more or less has in its uh, stable, uh, they found that with the list price they would end up paying more than if they subscribe to the big deals through the consortium, the Canadian consortium. They finally managed to convince Wally that there was no way they could justify such a price when the, the, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the university next door, namely McGill, uh, was getting the whole thing for uh, less money than what the University of Montreal was being proposed for, for its 350 titles. So finally the agreement came to uh, that the University of Montreal would get 350 titles, which covered 70% of the needs of the University of uh, Researchers. And it would pay as much as McGill, which on its side was getting everything. And you can see what Wiley's tactics were. It was a way to make our library look totally ridiculous. I mean, he's paying as much as McGill, he's getting only a fraction of what McGill gets, and he's no longer covering all the needs uh, of the university with regard to past usage of uh, Wiley, Wiley uh, uh, journals. Now, we must ask ourselves what, what was the strategy of Wiley behind that, and that's where they made a, an error. They made a, a really interesting error. They, they, they made an error because their expectations was that the faculty would rise and immediately say this, this is incompetence on the part of librarians and this is unacceptable and the, you know you imagine the, the, the faculty just screaming and yelling all over the campus for this sort of thing. Uh, the idea was to put un, unbearable pressure on a quote bad unquote librarian. Uh, the idea was to humiliate the institution to force it into submission and therefore scare all the other institutions in the, in the area, in the country, uh, to think twice before going down that road. And of course the expectation was to go back to the return to the normal state of affairs. And I must say that the, when that happened at the University of Montreal, the first meeting of the, of the union of, of professors, the, the faculty union, was exactly on the line that Wiley expected. You should have heard my colleagues standing up and just saying one after the other how stupid and uh, incompetent and bad the librarian was. And if I can flatter myself, I then rose and said, look people, stop that, the enemy is not the library. The enemy is Wiley. The enemy is Wiley. But we've got now to think about how to help the library while telling them while telling them also that maybe they didn't behave in the best possible way uh, with regard to Wiley. And why didn't they behave in the best possible way with regard to Wiley? Precisely because of this sort of professional tradition of being carpet bombers of information as against snipers. They say, we choose and the faculty will be happy with what we do. And there is very little consultation between the library and the faculty. Or there is formal stuff like, send us the ten more, more, uh, your 10 favorite journals, and they try to work their way through these kinds of things. But there is no real dialogue and real commitment to, to really speak with one another, to see how to really, really face the issues of getting access to the information that we need in the best possible way. Now, what did the administration expect, and why you had that to in its mind? Well, first of all, all administrations in the world have one familiar song, don't rock the boat, no waves. I, mean, I want to go through my mandate in order to get an even better job next time. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a completely self-serving self attitude for most administrators, and they don't want any controversy. And this is, becomes quickly controversial. Be careful about our rankings in the world. Now, this is the most stupid statement that a, 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 an administrator can make because we know that the basis for rankings is, is on the, you know, on the basis of the, the basis for the rankings is, is scientifically unsound. It's uh, all these kinds of impact factors and, and so, such uh, things, which everybody is genuflecting in front of, 
a debt which does not uh, reflect any sense of quality. It only brings about a, a, a game, a game to, um, to, to, to create competition among universities. And remember that when you create competition according to very strict rules to individuals or institutions, it's an excellent way to keep them in line and to discipline them. It's a disciplining tool, you know. It's a disciplining tool. Let me give you an example of uh, what competition does. Um, we had Jesse Owen in the 1936 Olympic Games uh, in, uh, in Berlin who won the 100 meter dash with a 10.2 uh, second per, for the 100 meter dash. We are now down with the, I forgot the name of the president of the holder, but from Jamaica. I think it's around 9.6 or, uh, or a bit below the thing. Two things to mention in, the, in this uh, regard. Um, we've, gone down, we've gone down to the hundredth of a, of a second, although it doesn't make sense to measure human uh, races of that short a, a length uh, to the hundredth of a second. The nervous impulse of, of human individuals is of the order of one to two tenths of a second. So we're measuring really the nervous impulse of people at best and not their ability to run fast. And, uh, and, and in fact, it's so true that if you start in a, in a, in a sprint race less than a tenth of a second after the signal, that, and of course, if you started after the signal, you still are disqualified. You know, so the, the people are well aware that a hundredth of a second means nothing, but that allows to make the competition more intense. It allows to have fewer people with the same results, and that creates a nice spectator sport. The second thing is that people have studied very closely what has happened technically to uh, the, the sprinting of the, between 1936 and nowadays, and with the new shoes and the new tracks and, and the, the new starting blocks and all that, you, people can measure the improvements in racing, which have nothing to do with human beings, but which have to do with better track, better shoes, and better starting blocks. And when you do all that, you find that probably nowadays, Jesse Owen would be just about at the level of our Jamaican uh, cha uh, champion. But for 60 years or 80 years now, we've been having an enormous amount of, um, of competition taking place, which has organized the lives of I don't know how many thousands of athletes based on those rules. But think of uh, university rankings in this way. The real role of rankings is not to describe the quality of the universities. The real role of, of rankings is to create power for those who are doing the rankings. And that means very, very little for us as researchers, for you as librarians, for students, or anybody else in that matter. And then the, the administration is going to say, we want, you, we want you to preserve our rankings, but we want to save money, which means you cut down on the, uh, on the collections and the, and the access licenses. And that means that in the rankings, if you start putting what the library can offer to its constituency, you're actually making a demand which is going to go against the desire to stay in the rankings. And this is completely incoherent. And uh, finally, those administrators have this bad habit of measuring the quality of their faculty, of their researchers, by where they publish and not by what they publish. In other words, instead of reading and evaluating the content of the work of the, uh, of the faculty, what they do is simply look where they publish. Did they publish in nature? in science, in the Lancet, in the, in the, in the, in the in similar things. And there again, this, this brings us to a, a, a series of demands that the, the administration does, which amount to uh, totally incoherent results, but it is what the publishers expect. And of course, they know that this is part of the, the arguments circulating in our institutions that help make that, uh, that uh, how would you call this, that this debate uh, go their way, that is to say, the faculty 
is going to have to publish in the so-called most prestigious journals. They're going to be judged by whether they do that or not, and so on and so forth. So, and what do researchers expe uh, expected to say? Well, most researchers, because they've been carefully kept away from the whole situation in the political economy of, of, of scientific publishing, just say, leave me alone. I, I don't have time for that. Give me what I need. I'm, I'm a spoiled brat. Give me everything I want. You know, give me everything I want. And, uh, and we don't have time to worry about all this. So the publishers really rely on this situation within the, the universities and the research centers to divide us, librarians, researchers, administration, and create impossible situations for the interface with the, yeah, the, the institution, which are, which are uh, and these are, our, of course, the libraries and the librarians. So I think it's high time for librarians to rebuild a close alliance with researchers, with faculty, and even with students. It's really high time. And I don't mean just sending a, a little sheet of paper or a, an email saying, tell us what are your 10 favorite journals. Really engage, really engage with, with the faculty. How to do that? How? Well, first of all, as I said, the knowledge snipers, researchers, have to understand how to do carpet bombing and, uh, and how, to, how you function, how you work in the libraries to, uh, to uh, acquire access to, to the, the documents. The kind of statistical tools you use and uh, why it works that way, why you have to do it that way, because you just don't have the resources and the time to satisfy individually each researcher according to their, their whims. So at the same time, the, 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 uh, the carpet bombers, the librarians, <laughs> must also realize that some of their old tools have been transformed under their own nose without really realizing what was, being, what was happening. In the 30s, during the Great Depression, libraries faced enormous financial pressures. That's when Bradford came out with his famous scattering law of information, which you all know, I'm sure, which roughly says that every time you want to augment, augment arithmetically the number of articles that are relevant for the topic, you'll have to consult a number which is growing geometrically uh, of journals so that in effect after having looked at some of the you might say productive journals from the field, you give up for the, the rest considering that this is on the fringe, that this is too difficult to get out, that you can do without, that this is good enough. All researchers work that way. An exhaustive bibliography on, the, on any topic in science and in, uh, in humanities and social sciences is an, a utopia. We work with the best we can. We do the best we can, but we do stop at some point. Now, when libraries were doing this, using this Bradford law, they were not using it in a sort of abstract, general way. They were looking at what their own constituencies were really using and noting what kind of journals locally were being used. And they, they, they uh, of course, uh, were um, trying to, to find the journals that were most productive for their local constituency. It was really based on what was going on within each research center, within each university. Then Garfield came along. So the, uh, the uh, Science Citation Index man, of course, and he invented what he thinks uh, is, a, is a law. He, re he, rever he, inversed, he inverted the Bradford law and said there's a concentration law. And in so doing, he created a myth, which was that science works everywhere the same way and every, in every discipline the same way. So you have a, a, a possibility at that point to claim that you can identify the core journals for everybody, any place on the planet, uh, for any discipline. And in fact, when he started doing the Science Citation Index, he was able to build a, a first collection, which actually was defined not by uh, some sort of relationship to the empirical base he was looking at, but which was actually defined by the limiting conditions 
imposed by his computers in the 1960s. He could not look at more than about a thousand titles at the time, and he decreed that this was good enough, and that he could do the whole job and have a thousand journals as the core site for the world, for the whole world. Then mysteriously, this number of core journals began to grow. How was it ever justified uh, as being now about 8,000 uh, titles? Nobody ever justified that. They just followed more or less what was possible and what was needed for the marketing of the services. But the, uh, the, uh, the law, uh, in quotation marks, uh, was, was revealing itself to be extraordinarily flexible. And then the next thing was to say to the librarians, you see, we've identified core science, which is a total myth. There is no core science. You don't have, uh, you don't have the same kind of, of concentration of journals in anthropology and in high energy physics, uh, if you take those two examples. So you don't, you, you instead, Garfield went out and said, you want all the same core journals because science is the same everywhere and these other journals you are you're interested in. And as you know, that created really an extraordinarily bad result for librarians because all librarians believed Garfield, found that a convenient way to base or build a basic journal collection that was easy to justify, Garfield says so, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and to the administration you could say, look, we have to buy those journals, Garfield says so, okay? Except that all libraries buying the same journals attracted the attention of good financial and business people like Robert Maxwell. And, the, and Maxwell said to himself, ooh, that's kind of nice. We're seeing there the emergence of what economists call an inelastic market. In other words, these journals, which are the core journals, are becoming so important, because they're core, uh, that the, the price can go very, very high without really affecting the demand, and libraries will just pay, and, uh, and they did. And the serial pricing crisis began to begin. So you, you see how this, this whole thing was built up. You talk, we're talking about which years? About the, that, uh, the beginning of the science, science citation index, conceptually speaking, was in the 60s, and the, in terms of its, you might say, institutional clout, uh, it came in the 70s, about 10 years later. Okay. There were other reasons for the success of the Science Citation Index, such as the reasons invoked by Joshua Lederberg, the Nobel Prize winner in uh, biochemistry, who uh, was very much annoyed by the fact that the, the bibliographies at this time were all disciplinary, and he was working in an interdisciplinary area, and by following citations, as the Science Citation Index obviously was doing, uh, he was finding the information he needed. And that, that to him was a, uh, an important argument, which contributed to the success of the Science Citation Index and its eventual authority in academic circles. But the economic uh, consequences of, this, of these things are, are really, really important to know. I mean, created an inelastic market, and then the thing starts prices start just shooting up, just shooting up. And the point for a publisher from that point on, from 19, the 1970s, is to do everything possible to make their journals enter the science citation index. That's how you make sure that your journals are going to sell, and that's how this is the way you ensure your, your profit rate. And that's when the big, the big uh, publishers began to really grow uh, very, very fast, very, very fast. You must remember that in the 60s, which is something that may look completely laughable to us nowadays, in the 60s, there were no publisher with a collection of journals of more than two or 300 journals. And that was considered big in, the, in those days. You know, Elsevier nowadays, I think, is over 2,500 journals. And uh, Riley's over 1,500 journals, and on and on and on. So, to all of this argument, which is, of course, what a Wiley at our university was resting on to try and put pressure on our librarian is, uh, is to respond that science is not the same everywhere. It's true that the results of science are the same everywhere, that they are, they are valid everywhere, that science 
as a as results to that claim universality. But at any moment of its history, science can raise far more questions that it can answer. For every question that uh, people can raise, the scientific community only really tackles a small fraction of those, constantly. You might even argue that this is a sort of critical path uh, sort of story because as scientists make choices in the questions they raise, this is going to influence the, in the way in which the next generation of questions is going to be, and so on and so forth. So the issue of question, which is far more, far more flexible and far more variable than people generally acknowledge, is something that the um, the universality of science constantly, very regularly forgets. So. If we want to reconnect librarians and research, it seems to me that a number of steps have to be taken, which are going to probably look strange to some of you at least, but which to me as a researcher appear extremely uh, important. I think that researchers really have to be really involved in at least some of the processes that are at the heart of the library profession. And one of them, which I think would be particularly important is having some good representatives of the faculty and the researchers to be involved with the negotiating teams. Now in my university our union now is demanding to have a representative of the negotiating team. I think that may be going a little bit too far and I've told them so but uh, at least being, being observer and I think that I think that by simply having some observers on what's going on really around the table when we negotiate uh, uh, with publishers would be terribly instructive and eye-opening for, for the faculty. They don't know. They don't realize how savage these uh, negotiations are. They don't know how the publishers behave uh, with, uh, with the libraries when they negotiate or with consortia. They don't know. And it would have, uh, and, and that would have also uh, a, another, another important thing. It would help the, the faculty to tell the libraries which are the important questions being dealt with uh, locally. In other words, sort of tailor the access to the information to the needs of the uh, to the needs of the local constituency, local population of researchers. Involving uh, publish faculty in negotiations, in, in negotiations with publishers, I think would have also um, the uh, the other other interest besides again showing the realities of statistical work and how you have to deal with that when you are a carpet bomber, as I say. It might also help librarians to resist confidentiality clauses. Faculty, especially if they are observers who come out of a meeting having seen the, the exact figures uh, might, might be willing to transgress the confidentiality clauses and dare, and dare the publishers to sue them, which librarians cannot do easily. But some faculty members, especially prestigious ones, probably could go forward and just spill the beans and, and, and tell the story to the whole institution. There is also the possibility that if they don't want to spill the beans, at least they would get irate enough, angry enough to ask, demand that this information be made public through appropriate legislation. I don't know how it is in Italy, but in, in North America there are rights of access legislation which allow to force the, uh, this kind of information to come out in the open. Uh, in the United States, a, a, a report was recently published with Paul Courant and other people, which shows that how, how tenacious the publishers are with regard to this information. They had to go to court. They had to really sue the companies in order to, or be sued by the companies, to see those companies lose those trials and be forced to uh, present the, the, the uh, the results, but the results we have are from 2009. You know, it took five years to get the results. But now that the thing is starting to move, we can expect that the time lag between the actual negotiation and the revelation of what happened is going to be shorter 
And that is going to stop for librarians the presence of this prisoner's dilemma in which they never know how to, to negotiate with publishers because they lack the information about the, the behavior of other libraries. How to, how to lean on past experience in order to get the best deal for your institution. I think that uh, it, it would be a good way to, uh, to, to, uh, to I mean, to, to keep a close watch on the, on the scientific questions that are of local, but by local you can define it in a number of ways. It could be the institutional interest, but you could have also a group of, like, of institutions working for a country that tries to decide a science policy with the questions that are crucial for that particular phase of the science policy, or even in the, in the case of Italy uh, for a European concerns. But in order to do, to do this, it seems to me that's where really the open access issue begins to come into play. The, the, uh, the, the repositories can, can be uh, really important. It seems to me, in fact, they are quite ideal if they have a strong mandate attached to them. Why? Well, if you look at the example of the Liège University, and I know that some of the elements, uh, Juan Carlos has explained that to me, some of the elements of the mandate in Liège would not work very easily or, or directly in Italy, but let's keep the, the example of Liège uh, for a different reason. We find that when Liège organized its repository with the way they organized it, which really made people deposit, essentially in Liège, the rector of Liège said, you don't have to deposit, but then if you ask me anything, like a promotion or whatever, uh, I'm going to look only at what is inside the repository. So you can well imagine that then people were depositing like crazy just to make sure that they were not going to be uh, forgotten by, by the university. Well, one of the important things that developed out of that is that Rantier, the rector of Liège, discovered that his university was published was publishing almost twice as many paper, papers as he thought the university was publishing. Now that's an important thing for an, an administration. It's an important thing for librarians because you would have there a very thorough representation of the fields of interest and the questions being raised in your local constituency. And when you, you, when you start arguing with, with publishers about, about uh, the um, the prices and the kind of access you want to journals, you can tailor your, your request for access to very precisely to what people no, locally really need. You know, you can always tweak that later on with some secondary measures to complete that if there are things forgotten, but you can really start doing a precise <laughs> and really good job with, uh, with the publishers. So open access there becomes something more than just a principle becomes more than simply uh, a way of looking at access to information in a universal, general, and homogeneous way. It becomes a form, a form of uh, uh, organization of access to knowledge which can be tailored to the uh, local situation. And that to me is extremely important because I think open access itself as a movement has been too universalistic has forgotten about the specificities of countries, of regions, of institutions, and treats everybody a bit like publishers, as if they were all the same, with the same size for everybody doing the same, and so on and so forth, for the great big rankings of the world. That's crazy. That's completely crazy. On the contrary, I think open access can reopen the possibility of a diversified approach to science according to the local demands, needs, and, and uh, kinds of uh, issues that are of interest locally. So it seems to me that with this, with this, uh, this thing in mind, we can start building up even more things about open access and, um, and see what it could, how it could help uh, create even uh, better alliances between librarians and researchers. And there are, there are a number of ways in which you can do it. You can get into the evaluation game with open access. Again, if you take the Liège system and you want to evaluate a professor, you don't do as my university does, and you do perhaps more as Liège does. What does my university do for the promotion of a professor? 
They have a little line that says, when you form your dossier, your file for your promotion, you may, add, you may add any document you want to support your case, except the actual articles that you have published. We don't need to read your articles. We know how good you are by the kind of journals you've published in. So they're the following at my university the very, the very uh, sort of strategy of evaluation which, of course, reinforces the publisher's role because they're the ones who control the, publish, the titles. And we've got to get away, move away from an evaluation based on titles. We have to go back to the actual content of that. Now, repositories offer the possibility of doing that sort of thing if the university is, uh, has a clear mind about how to do a, a, a sort of measure of quality you can do it by having the juries actually read those papers. Now, you're, they're going to say, oh, we don't have the time, and it's, uh, it's not useful. Uh, there's going to be a reaction against that from, from the members of the juries. Give them the resources to do so. Take a course away from them. And, and then university administrators will say, we don't have the money. And my answer is, yes, you would have the money if you didn't pay so much money for those journals. And if you start moving away from journal title for evaluation, you're going to put a pressure on the price of these journals because they're no longer going to be so strategically important for the careers of the faculty. Now, there, are, there, are, there is a long way to go on that thing, but I think it's, it's a vision, it's a direction that we should keep in mind and where the open access and the repositories with the help of libraries and create new alliances between um, the faculty and the library. If we have to move away from journal titles. We have to move away from any evaluation that just says, if you publish in this journal, then you're automatically good. Makes no sense whatsoever. So, with all this together, you have a, a battle that can be waged now with researchers and, and librarians together facing the publishers. You have a system of a front which is uniting also at least some of the interests of the administration as well. And that would mean that the expectations of the Wileys of the world or the Elsevier's of the world to see the librarians caught between a hard rock, a, a, a rock and a hard place, as the saying goes, uh, that expectation would start disappearing, waning away. You could have the research institution coming out as a united, as a unified front. So it seems to me uh, that finally libraries also can help with open access to uh, create alliances with, with the uh, researchers uh, by also helping them publish. And now here is a trend where I think for the profession something very promising is appearing. The consortium of uh, library publishers in the United States I think is a very good example of that. Um, libraries can really start creating networks of libraries to support the creation of journals that will not be taxed for, of being just local mediocre little journals meant to support simply what a, a, a particular uh, university does, but really create very powerful networks of, of, um, of journals that can be created that way. And it's not very expensive. So you can also get involved, and that brings us back to the notion of evaluation, uh, by uh, using the repositories and creating forms of evaluation on top of the repositories, which are totally separate from journal titles. New forms, which could be from the downloads and whatever you want to, simply having the papers being selected by something like a faculty of a thousand that was invented by Biomed Central at least 15 years ago to recreate forms of evaluation which are not trying to do a ranking of people but at least to establish, but instead to establish a form of uh, quality value. And, as I've said, by getting involved in the publishing business themselves. And that's it. Molto grazie, Nazar. As you see, I hate slides. I find that constraint. Uh, Professor Binon has spoken 
a lot about the library profession, so I would like to give the word first of all to our librarians uh, attending the meeting and, uh, and also to the other people as well, but particularly the librarians. Anybody wants to comment or say something? Okay, broader call. Anybody wants to <coughs> comment uh, on uh, this call to action of Professor Gidon? Uh, the, I will, in the meantime, and some, meanwhile, as some people think about a potential comment or question, I will say that in the last couple of months, uh, we've been going around uh, uh, talking about open access and really about uh, not so much the technical aspects or, or repositories, but more broadly about what is open access uh, in a broader sense, how it could be a key component of a new way of discovery communication. And my main relief point was, uh, yes, we have to have this alliance uh, between uh, librarians and researchers. We have to involve the researchers because without their involvement, they perceive open access like uh, just another bureaucratic uh, procedure they have to do in the case of a mandate. But in any case, without their real involvement, intellectual and even emotional involvement. Uh, and so that's exactly what we started to do. And uh, I have to say that uh, at least some colleagues uh, start to tune at that level. But of course, it must be much broader than that, than just a few. We need uh, a significant active minority in order to change things. I will uh, revert back to what I was saying. I think open access has, in the last 12, 15 years, has evolved rather nicely. Um, but it's, it's bumping against a number of uh, obstacles right now, which I think make its future more complicated than we, we were hoping for maybe three or four years ago. Um, one thing is that for the repositories, um, researchers don't use them. I mean, let's be clear about that. Do you know researchers are doing research using repositories as a primary source of information? No. Maybe as a last des desperate move, they'll go to Google Scholar and then by chance discover some, some articles uh, which are in open access in some place uh, which can ri range from a, a personal website to a, an institutional repository. But people by and large, researchers, do not use re repositories. That's nonsense. The whole point of uh, repositories is supposed to put things into access for researchers. So one has to re really think about the, I would say, the daily life of research in your institution and how the re repository relates to that daily life of research. How can it help this daily life of the, of the research? And one way in which it can be helpful is in helping you tailor precisely what people really need to do their research in terms of licensing and all that, at the same time that you start filling the repositories so as to project this production outside, uh, outside the, uh, the institutional walls. There is a point I didn't make today, with, uh, which I've made in the past. You made, some of you may have heard me see that, say that in the, in the past, which is also that sooner or later, whatever is in a repository, which has been nicely uh, curated by the librarians, that content in the repository should be citable as is. In other words, give it a permanent uh, address in the web and allow people to cite it. Uh, that again will push, uh, pull, I mean, the information away from the journal title. People will start saying, oh, they have good stuff in that repository because it is citable. And you could say on, the, on your website, uh, you know, we encourage you to cite, to cite us directly, at least beside the journal, at least beside the journal. And what will happen is that people having the URL, for example, permanent URL on the, on the, in, in, in the citations, uh, the readers will then click them and go directly to your repository. Now, of course, publishers are going to scream about that because they would like things to go directly back to them. But there you say, no, I'm going to just, and I'm going to cite, even quote, quote the information from that repository including the situations in which quoting from that article may lead to a very different kind of bibliographic notice. You know, because uh, 
this will be the repository version of the outcome. But give it status, give it standing, make it, make it uh, part of the actual life of the researcher. If you're just there sitting there with uh, documents which are not even in the, uh, in the PDF format of the publisher, uh, as for example Elsevier insists that it should be the case, but what are people doing? And you don't say to people, yes, you can cite and quote what's inside our repository. We've, we've made sure that this is a good text, uh, credible text, authoritative text, as much as the, as the publishers. Uh, researchers will just ignore you because they'll say, I can't use that stuff. I can read it, but then, okay, but many times it's useful for people in the third world who will have no access to that uh, information. But uh, for, uh, for most of our researchers in most of our universities, they have enough standard access to enough standard journals to say, well, why should I bother with repositories? So you have to really make those repositories fun functionally important and in close, uh, in close relationship with the researchers' work. And to do that, you need to involve researchers can design that from within the university, the library without speaking to researchers and getting them really involved. In that. And again, the play on the specificities of the local condition. It's, uh, Can you say a few more words about that uh, coalition of uh, library publishers? Is that what you said? Yes, I, I haven't followed that movement very, very closely. There are about 50 libraries in the United States which have formed a consortium with the idea that together they could, with financial help from all these libraries, they could help support the, the production of journals. That would be, in a sense, uh, authoritative because it would be coming from something far more than just one institution. So that, the, the, for example, the editorial boards can be taken from a number of researchers, from a number of universities and institutions. And that, again, is an interesting way for libraries to speak to researchers. We're going to organize a platform for you. We're going to help create the formats. We're going to create the, the, the way to navigate all this information. And we're going to try finding people who are interested in that to become the editors and the part of the editorial board of that. That means for many researchers, they have an opportunity to play a really interesting role in new kinds of journals, which could, of, of course, enhance their own career. Their librarians and researchers become truly allies and play together. For the librarians, this means an entirely new direction for the profession, which rests on the old idea of navigating information, but also producing now, uh, helping produce information that's new. And for the researchers, it means that instead of dealing with publishers that are outside the academic sphere, we deal with publishers that are inside the academic sphere, yet constituted in such a way that the notion of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, you know, the sort of uh, I'm looking for the word, but uh, the kind of mediocrity that could emerge from saying, uh, I'll give you one, you give me one, that sort of thing, is largely, largely uh, negated and neutralized by the openness and the spread of the network that's behind this kind of endeavor. And I think that's, that's very, very interesting. Another element I did not uh, mention there, and I think they're also looking into that, is that consortia of libraries working with repositories could transform those repositories with the right peer review, the right kind of, uh, the right kind of uh, quality evaluation that should be done, could transform that network of libraries, of repositories, into a super journal like PLOS One, you know, and create a, a, a new PLOS One, uh, call it PLOS Two, <laughs> but, uh, which would allow, which would allow uh, again to create visibility and authority for researchers in areas which may not be terribly well covered yet by open access or not very authoritative to cover by open access. Because again, let's not make a, a big mistake about that. But when you look at the journals in DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, there are close to 10,000 journals in DOAJ, if my memory serves me right. But when you look 
honestly at these journals, many of them are extremely small and you know, have no particular prestige attached to that. And if we, if we go down the road of DOAJ as it is doing right now, you're just helping maintaining the relationship, the alleged relationship between quality and title. You know, we've got to break that relationship. So DOAJ is interesting in creating visibility for open access journals, but it is not solving the issue of evaluation uh, from, with means other than journal titles. The impact factor, as you know, is the obsession of uh, pro promotion and tenure committees all over the world. And it's, uh, it's, it's really a pity. It's really a pity. It's creating uh, a, a very perverse and very unhelpful system for scientific communication. OK, any question? Yes. I like very much what uh, I read uh, in an article uh, you wrote uh, about the, the possibility, uh, besides the peer review journal on uh, the international repository, uh, to um, give uh, the, another kind of evaluation um, and uh, give the researchers the possibility to make comments, suggestions, and to create uh, the, the possibility when uh, there is a big change in uh, an article made by another researcher of the Rufery community to become co-authors of the, the, the article that was born uh, by, right. at the beginning. So it really uh, would help to break, to break uh, this uh, bad, uh, um, how to say, <laughs> System of evaluation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, for my experience, I can tell that uh, our repository is a uh, it's a short life, and uh, there are um, a, a few more than three thousand full ex uh, open um, full uh, um, full title uh, articles. But uh, there are a big downloads because more or less five hundred downloads every uh, day. Mm -hmm that tells us that we have to go on this way uh, and uh, to, to receive all the suggestions that you gave us. Thank you very much. Okay. I may respond to this. Indeed, the, uh, in, we're, we're only seeing the beginning of what scientific communication is going to be like, say, 30 or 40 years from now. And the, the, the changes are going to be as momentous as moving from medieval manuscripts to the invention of the periodical. We forget how, how incredibly revolutionary the production of scientific periodicals in the 17th century uh, were. You know, we think it's just old hat. It is old hat, but at the time, this was really, really something entirely new. I think the model there towards which we are going to be moving inexorably is uh, a kind of work in progress, constant work in progress and people building into the, the, the questions and the issues by producing sometimes very small contributions, sometimes producing very major contributions. The model being, in a sense, like a peer-reviewed Wikipedia you know, of, of, of sorts. You could imagine that as the, as the horizon. I think publishers are ready to go into that direction themselves, but they want to control it. They want to control it to their advantage. And the whole point of, uh, I suppose, of, of what I'm trying is that if researchers and librarians work together, we can keep that within the logic and the philosophy and the, the ethos of the academic world without having to deal with commercial issues of all kinds which are creating all sorts of problems. Just one problem that I find totally unacceptable in the present system. Nowadays, when a learned society goes to a publisher, because they can't do it anymore um, financially, they go to a publisher to try and have their journal with that publisher. The publisher very, very often, most of the time, insists on owning the title of the journal. They become the owners of the title of the journal of the learned society. Which means that if that society is no longer happy with the publisher, they have to recreate a new journal with a new title. And as everything is based on branding through journal titles, you can imagine the problem there is. There is a further problem. 
the old, this has happened a few times nonetheless, but the old journal, which is deserted by its editorial board, then is repopulated by who? By the publisher. The publisher is choosing people, saying, inviting them to be part of the editorial board, including with the financial you know, in, in, uh, incentives. Now, is it the role of the publisher to choose and select scholars, particular scholars who are willing to play ball with the publisher and, or, and thereby orient the kinds of questions that will be privileged by that journal in the future through a, a direct publisher intervention. It's not very different from the situation where a government uh, affects and influences directly a television station or a radio station. We're getting into this kind of, sort of situation with private publishers. And I think that's extremely extremely dangerous. Another, another thing we have to be very careful about is that the digitization of scientific documents uh, is also creating new, a new reality for documents. A, do a digital document is not the simple transposition of a, of, a, of a printed document any more than an article in a public printed um, periodical was the equivalent of a medieval manuscript. I mean, they, they are entirely different kind of uh, values and kinds of, kinds of things. Now, one of the important things that is happening more and more, and it's becoming ever more prominent with a digital document, is that machine reading of the document is appearing to be perhaps even more important than uh, eye reading of the document. We are getting into a world in which you first treat them with the, the documents with your machines, computers, and then you extract and organize parts of the informational potential of that document in a specific way. And then once it's really organized and has been worked together with the right kinds of algorithms, then the human eye encounters that. Well, guess what? Publishers are making very sure that only through you, that you can mine those documents only through them as a service. And I predict one thing, I've been predicting that for at least a couple of years now, maybe I'll be, I'll be uh, proved wrong, but I can see within, say, three to five years, Elsevier making a big announcement saying, tomorrow, henceforth, all of our articles will be open access. What will that mean? It means that everybody can read with their eyes those documents, but any treatment you want to do with those documents and everything will be sold as a service by us uh, to libraries, to individuals and so on, and including the relationship with the data, including the, uh, the, the software that is uh, uh, available to, to mine these, uh, these things, all this will be sold as service. And there will be an illusion of a great gift to the world. Anybody can read, but we're getting into a world in which through one thing, the immense quantity of information which really requires now machines to help us find and grab that information. And that's where repositories can really be an important tool. And through the, um, what do you call this, the, the, also the evolution of scientific work, which more and more is, re is relying on models and, and uh, the, the associated algorithms that make these models work. We're going through a, a third epistemological revolution in science right now beyond logic and beyond experimentalism, we're introducing now modeling as the, as the way to create our relationship to reality. Now, if all this is being, particularly the last part, the modeling and the tools to do models through the data and through the, uh, the, the published articles, if all this is controlled by commercial interests, what's happening to our relationship to reality, the kind of science we produce? I find that these questions very disquieting, very, very, very annoying personally. Any comment or other question? Yeah, yeah. Just for the so, uh, One of the ar arguments which uh, is used sometimes also to promote uh, open access is uh, that let's say related with playing the same uh, game of a publisher with uh, impact factor, age index, and similar things, just 
trying to, to argue, which is trying to measure the fact uh, that uh, maybe open access uh, has a positive impact on these metrics, which are supposed to be the rules of a game that you are so fiercely opposing. <laughs> but uh, do, you, do you think it makes sense? Uh, do you think, do you have some specific caveats apart from saying it's not a good idea maybe <laughs> to play this, uh, this, uh, this, this game with the rules of uh, your enemies? But uh, so I just wanted some, some comments about this. Well, I'm not a good Jesuit, and I don't sleep well with the enemy, <laughs> you know, so that would be the first uh, form of my response. I, I know, and you, you know, and uh, Juan Carlos knows that, I'm a good friend of, actually, of Stevan Hanna, despite very fierce debates with him. And I know Stevan has defended this sort of thing by saying, create, calling it, in fact, the only advantage. Uh, you have increased citations, increased in the, that sort of thing. And some people quite amusingly, uh, like Phil Davis, have tried to contest that it existed and so on. Everybody being locked in this kind of game of uh, citations, citation measurements and all this, based uh, on the old myth of the, um, of the cite citation index that you could, you could measure quality through some algorithm attached to citation, while actually what you're measuring with citations is your visibility and perhaps the amount of authority you might, you might command in a certain kind of community. I think, I think that this is the, the, really the distinction one has to keep in mind. So if that distinction is true, if that distinction is not true rather it's real, and uh, we, uh, we deal with it as a reality, I would say let's forget about all these, all these arguments which in effect do no more than plunge back the science that we want to create in this communication system right back into the, the, the environment where age factors and, uh, and the titles of journals and, and some kinds of, I would say, uh, uh, imperfect scenarist algorithms attached to citations are the, are the, are the kings of the day. Uh, let's forget about that. Let's use open access on the contrary to really explore, because there you would have the whole latitude to really do the work correctly, let's see how we can use open access to create evaluations of quality besides directly reading the articles. I mean, I realize that doing an evaluation of articles by reading them requires a lot of work. We do it in peer review, after all, and it's, it's long and it, it, it requires a lot of effort. But and let's, let's see if we can do better, a better job to find tools that would allow us to create real quality uh, evaluations uh, of, the, of the articles. And let's do it in such a way that we avoid a ranking outcome. In other words, I go back to an old argument of mine, which is let's not give to a, an evaluation um, algorithm some sort of figure which like the time of running 100 meters or the impact factor allows to classify and rank people very, 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 apparently very precisely. Let's simply see at what levels of quality, three, four levels of quality, that's all we need to uh, these works are. And let's make sure that when an evaluation of quality of a, of a paper is done at one moment in history, there is, there are ways, then we go back to the interactive uh, relationship with the readers and their contribution. Let's see if there are ways to correct or to modify or to edit the evaluation of quality done at time T1 uh, when we get to time T2 or time T3 later on in history. These are, I think, the kinds of projects we should be exploring uh, with open access. And there again, I think, with all your bibliometric experience within the libraries, there is there a base of knowledge which could be not simply transposed, but could be used on the contrary to criticize what has been done in the past and move beyond uh, yet looking at, uh, let's say, elements of texts uh, in, 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 let's say, algorithmic ways which would make the, the sort of first cut, kind of rough cut, of quality evaluation possible by machines uh, without falling prey to the ranking obsession that we fall into. This is my, my old saw about let's forget about ex excellence. 
as a form of competition, let's move to real quality evaluation. Thank you. If there are no other questions or comments, uh, uh, is it? Okay, then I would like to thank again Professor Gidon for his talk and his comments. Thank you.